In 1881, the French began work on a Trans-Panama Canal, but by 1889, the effort had proven a failure. But as a former Secretary of the Navy, the brash young President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, fully understood the strategic importance of a canal across the Panamanian Isthmus. No single great material work which remains to be undertaken on this continent is of such consequence to the American people. When Colombia balked at the American desire for autonomy in constructing the canal, a brief revolution ensued, and the nation of Panama emerged, with a new government perfectly agreeable to the American demands. America secured rights to all Trans-Panama transportation along a 10-mile wide swath, including the Panamanian Railroad. Railways would be key to the removal of millions of cubic yards of earth and rock. The Herculean task of actually digging those millions of cubic yards fell to Bucyrus Designed and Built Equipment. The company had just relocated to larger facilities in South Milwaukee. That was fortunate because Bucyrus would be called on to supply 70% of the equipment used to dig the canal. One of the first challenges was to tame the Chagres River. Millions of tons of earth and rock were moved to create the largest artificial lake in the world. Gatton Lake would soon provide hydroelectric power for the dining halls and hospitals and dormitories of the dig, as well as the many small towns and villages along the route of the canal. Whatever task was assigned them, those early steam shovel designs proved to be untiring workhorses. The majority of them operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of these were 95-ton behemoths, able to remove eight tons in one scoop. The first two of these to arrive quickly outpaced the railway's ability to remove the spoil. Additional railways were laid, and more 95-ton shovels were brought to the task. Eventually, there were 32 of them on the job. Soon, there were also 28 70-ton Bucyrus shovels working as well. All the Bucyrus equipment was built at the company's Milwaukee plant, partly disassembled for shipment, reassembled in Panamanian marshalling yards, and put to work immediately. Every month dreamed of driving one of those amazing machines. But no, we earned our 10 cents an hour with picks and shovels. But we loved to watch them work. They were beautiful. Bucyrus also provided 10 somewhat more agile 45-ton steam shovels, which augmented the work of the pick and shovel laborers. Like the other Bucyrus designs, they added serious mechanical muscle to the entire length of the project. The 100-ton Bucyrus railway train and the two 75-ton models were tireless in the constant shifting of 160 miles of rail to accommodate the locomotives and 4,000 hopper cars that carried away the spoils. The railroads, like the steam shovels, ran 24 hours a day, but it took the massive shovel buckets very little time to fill a train. A new train arrived every minute and a half. The length of the cuts were filled night and day with the smell of steam and exhaust, the scream of whistles and the incessant roar of drilling and blasting. The Bucyrus shovels were hugely successful, setting records every month for cubic yards removed. At Gaton alone, two million cubic yards were removed at a depth as much as 300 feet below the surrounding topography, enough to encircle Manhattan four times over. For wet work, there were Bucyrus-built dredges, designs which would improve and one day become a Bucyrus specialty. The sheer scale of the Panama Day was breathtaking in its immensity, and there were setbacks. Breaks, floods, and slides often varied both men and machines. That damned Calabra cut, <laughs> you know, just when we thought we had an edge on it, we'd have a break. Lost some good men that way. Good equipment, too. Well, couldn't do anything about it, so we just kept digging. The technology provided by Bucyrus was proving to be the very blood and sinew of a young and hopeful nation, and promised of greater things to come. 
Despite torrential rains, punishing heat, and rampant disease, the digging went on and on. Teddy Roosevelt was the first president to leave the country while in office, but he couldn't resist seeing the work firsthand. In Panama, he even posed for photographs while seated at the controls of a massive Bucyrus steam shovel. When he returned home, he made an impassioned speech to Congress. They are doing something that will resound immensely to the credit of America, which will benefit all the world and which will last for ages to come. In May of 1913, Bucyrus shovels 222 and 230, dug and ceremoniously dumped the last spoilage, rolled forward and met in the middle of the Culebra cut. After almost 10 years of titanic labor, the Americans had dug the Panama Canal. On October 10, 1913, at two o'clock in the afternoon, in the Oval Office in Washington, the new president, Woodrow Wilson, pressed the telegraph key, completing a circuit. And in Panama, the temporary dam on Gamboa Lake was breached by a buried charge. The canal began to fill with water. A 500-year-old dream had been realized. The globe's two great oceans had been joined. Despite the worldwide attention the audacious attempt had created for more than a decade, its inauguration was no more than back page news. Instead, the front page headlines screamed of German advances across Belgium and the onset of the Great War. The work done by the Bucyrus steam shovels, dredges, and cranes in the completion of the canal was generally unheralded. But without them, the task would have been unthinkable. In the completion of the Panama Canal, Bucyrus and the men who designed, built, and operated these amazing machines had changed the face of the globe and defined America to the world.